Hello, and thank you for joining me for Patient Teaching About Clinical Data. This is part of our two-minute EBP challenge. If you haven't already joined us for our two-minute EBP challenge, you can go to our website, edfornurses.com, and you can sign up right there on the home screen. On our two-minute EBP challenge, every Friday I send out a question to you that's based on evidence. And then on Monday, you get the response to that challenge question. In addition, you also get entered into a drawing for a prize every week. So, fantastic opportunity. Avail yourself of it by going to edfornurses.com and signing up. This week we're talking a little bit about this whole idea of how we're going to do effective patient teaching with our patients. First of all, one of the concepts that's very important to understand is this concept here of health literacy. Health literacy is different from literacy in general. When we think of literacy, often we think of a patient's education level and a patient's ability to be able to understand things that we're saying to them. In health literacy, you may have somebody who is very well educated, but does not understand principles that are involved in health care. So we want our patients to be able to get the information we're giving to them and be able to use it as we give it to them. Again, don't assume that your patient is going to understand these concepts. Here's an example of one time that we do this on a regular basis. When your patient or family member is a nurse or physician, don't you often assume that they already have basic understanding of what the problem is? This is an assumption that many of us make, probably not a good assumption to make because it can lead to miscommunication and misunderstanding on part of the patient and or the family members. So make sure we are communicating well with the patient and family and we need to assess for what their health literacy is. How able are they to be able to understand the directions and the information that we're giving to them? There are some principles of adult learning that may be helpful when we're doing our patient teaching. With adults, it's a little bit different than the process of learning with children. So if you have children and you teach them or you help them to understand the lessons that they're learning in school, you may have noticed a different way of approaching teaching in those situations. With adults, though, we have to teach a little bit differently. First of all, adults need to have a perceived need for learning the information in the first place. So again, we can connect to that perceived need by talking about what's going on with their medical problem or their rehabilitation. We want to progress from the known to the unknown. So as often as possible, if you can make connections to things they already know. So if they already have an understanding of part of their illness, or maybe they understand that a family member has had a similar kind of an illness. These are things that we want to try to connect to because to them that is a known. We can also connect back to their previous experience. So when we're talking about a recovery, maybe from a disease process, we might want to connect back to how the patient previously recovered from the flu or from fracturing an ankle or something like that, some previous experience that they had which is known to them. And then connect that to the unknown which would be the new disease process that we're in the process of trying to teach our patient about. Start with the simple, move to the complex. So don't get right into the complex things. You don't want to start out by bringing in that model of the heart and showing the patient the coronary arteries when the patient has absolutely no idea uh, what this chest pain is from. So maybe we want to start out a little bit more simple with that patient and start talking about the symptoms that they're having and how that can relate to the fact that their heart isn't working very well. Next we want to have active participation on the part of the patient or the family members in this learning process. So more participation is going to equal more integration of that information into their own behaviors. Additional learning principles also involve practicing new skills. So if we're teaching somebody about how to give insulin, the best way for them to be able to really integrate that information and be able to use that information is if you can have them practice the skill of giving insulin. So have them draw it up, have them do it on themselves, and then that's going to help to reinforce that learning. Reinforce the behaviors that the patient is doing good and bad. So as we go along, so the patient is drawing up the insulin and maybe they're holding the vial in a way that's not going to help them to draw up the insulin. I've seen this done before where a patient has drawn up air because of the way 
way they're holding the insulin syringe. Now we can go back and say, okay, now notice that the way that you have drawn this up is going to lead to drying up air and you're not getting any of the insulin back. So we want to reinforce that was a uh, probably not a very effective behavior. On the other hand, if the patient uses good skills in the new technique that we just taught them. We want to reinforce that behavior and give them some praise for having done it right. Adult learners also want immediate feedback, so we want to tell them right away about whether or not they're on track, whether or not they're on, not on track, and give them a lot of reassurance along the way. And certainly the best way to do that would be if we're in the room doing some one-on-one -on -one teaching with that patient and showing them as they go along. Corrections of misconceptions is also important here with adult learners. So we want to correct those misconceptions as we go along. Now you've probably already experienced this on many occasions occasions when your patient or the patient's family has misconceptions about a disease process and we have to try to correct those as we go through in our teaching. So that's another thing that's going to be important when we're teaching adults. There's a number of different ways that we can do this. Some of the methods we can use are one-on-one -on -one teaching. That is probably a great method to use with many of your patients. However, you don't have time to do a lot of one-on-one -on -one teaching with all of your patients for all of the different things that they may need teaching about. Therefore, group teaching may be helpful. Oftentimes, this is done in the form of a group, maybe a support group and things like that. That may be another way to do group teaching. And oftentimes, hospitals will have classes about diabetes and childbirth and other topics like that where we can do group teaching. Written materials may be helpful, especially for patients to take home and to review. So after your patient has left the hospital, they're going to forget a lot of what you taught them. Written materials to refer back to is going to be a really great aid. They can spend some time at their own leisure going back over the materials and helping to really kind of let that stuff sink in. Computers, and many hospitals have computers available for patients to use so that they can use some of the materials that are available at the hospital as far as teaching resources go. Lastly, internet resources. In a study done about five years ago by the American Medical Association, they found that 70% of patients wanted to have internet resources as part of their discharge instructions. Now that's been quite a while ago, and many, many more people are on the internet now than ever before. So anticipate that your patients probably want internet resources as part of their discharge instructions and that may be a very valuable thing that you want to give them. When we're presenting the data to our patient, we want to make sure that we are being clear. Avoid being vague. As the street sign shows, very difficult to figure out which way we're going on this street. So we want to avoid being vague. We want to avoid using jargon. This is so common in healthcare. We're so used to using jargon. We talk to each other in jargon all the time. But we need to put the jargon aside when we're talking to patients and families. They don't understand it. And in many cases, they won't tell you that they don't understand it because they're afraid of looking stupid or not being educated, etc. So they don't want to tell you this, but oftentimes that can be a problem. Connect to the patient. Connect to the family. That's the best way to get your message across is to connect to them. So they're going to be more likely to ask questions. They're going to be more likely to tell you where they don't understand things. The best way to connect to your patient is in the first 30 seconds of your encounter with that patient each day. Make sure you are connecting. Connecting means going into the patient's room and asking them an open-ended question such as, what troubles you most today? And then allowing the patient the time to be able to answer your question. Now obviously you can't spend the entire day in the room listening to a long-winded answer, but certainly you can connect with what their primary problem is, their primary concern, and hopefully you can at least Mobilize some resources for that primary concern. Use empathy. When we're giving data to someone, it's important that we're using empathy in order to, for them to be able to feel like we are really connecting with them and that we understand and that 
we are sympathetic to what is happening. So we want to be careful about the way we're presenting the data, and it's not just presented in a very clinical, dry manner, but that we're presenting it with empathy. And then lastly, keep it simple. Very important that we're keeping it simple so that the patient can understand it. Understand that your patients in the hospital are already going through a whole bunch of stuff. They're worried about whether or not they're going to get back to work. They're worried about who's taking care of the kids or who's taking care of that sick husband at home. They've got all sorts of worries going on. They don't need to also be worried about trying to decode our language as we're talking to them. Now when we're presenting numbers to our patient, which of these three do you think is more understandable? When we're telling a patient about a fairly rare side effect of a medication, would it be best to say that five in a hundred people get the side effect, five percent of people get the side effect, or that the side effect is rare? Well, in fact, in a recent study, they found that the most understandable way to present this information to our patients is to talk about it in terms of the 5%. So more patients are going to understand what the numbers mean and how frequent this is going to happen by saying 5%, rather than just saying rare. Rare, again, is kind of vague. Okay, so that, what is rare? You know, to rare might, to one person that might mean 20%, to another person that might mean less than 1%. So that's kind of vague. Five in a hundred, people have a hard time understanding those kind of statistics. So instead, what they ask us to use is frequencies in terms of percentage. So rather than using the direct frequency, five in a hundred, we're going to talk about a percentage. So what can you do? First of all, understand that there's going to be some difficulty in presenting the data that you need to to your patients. Assess their level of health literacy so that you can better understand where they're coming from. Keep it simple. Avoid jargon. And then wherever possible when we're talking about numbers, use percentages because that's what patients can better relate to. Now if you'd like to find this article and find out more information about using percentages rather than using rather frequent data, check out this article by Wollashin et al. Uh, 2001 in the Annals of Internal Medicine. I want to thank you for joining me this week for our two-minute EBP challenge. My name is David Woodruff. I'm the president of Ed for Nurses, where we empower nurses to become extraordinary. Check us out online by going to www.edfornurses.com. Thanks for joining me this week, and until next time, bye now.